So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the Surgical uh, Fix Volume 2 series. Uh, today's session is going to be uh, about the neuroendocrine uh, tumors uh, given by Dr. Xavier uh, Kutgen. Dr. Xavier is an endocrine and neuro neuroendocrine surgeon. is an assistant professor of surgery and director of the University of Chicago Neuroendocrine Tumor Center. Welcome with us, Dr. Xavier. Thank you. Welcome for having me. So uh, just as usual, before we start, if you have any question, please type it in the Q&A panel. And uh, for future Search Kuwait session, please refer to the chat. Uh, Dr. Xavier, you can share your screen and start the session. Thank you very much. All right, so I guess we have about an hour to do this. Um, so I will go through um, all these slides. Um, and then my understanding is that if you have questions, we will leave them uh, for the end of the session. So today I'm going to talk to you about neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I got um, something uh, to disclose, which was from last year, actually, uh, that I am a consultant for a, uh, a company, which is now Novartis, and which makes PRT, which is uh, used to treat uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So um, the way that I'm going to um, phrase this talk is I'm going to talk first to you about a little bit of um, history. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors. We'll talk about um, uh, each uh, subtype. We'll talk about how to treat them, what are the treatment um, options. And then we'll also talk about um, a couple of things that perhaps are a little bit uh, like controversial, but that are, uh, I think, really important to know for surgeons, such as do we need to remove the gallbladder in people that have neuroendocrine tumors, et cetera. So let's get at it because I got 50 or 60 slides. So uh, a little bit of history. Um, so Rudolf Heidenhain and uh, Nikolai Kolchiski uh, from Germany and Russia uh, recognized uh, around 1870 and 1897 that there were a separate group of uh, gastrointestinal cells with a yellow uh, chromatin uh, staining. That is Dr. Uh, Kolchiski right there. Uh, Paul Langerhans then, which you probably know from the Langerhans um, eyelid cells in 1869, described those cells um, in the pancreas, but did not recognize that they were secreting insulin and um, other hormones at the time. And then a very important person for neuroendocrine uh, tumors or NETS, I'm going to say NETS because it's going to shorten things a little bit, um, is Siegfried um, Overdorfer, who also was a German, who coined the term carcinoid which we quite commonly still use nowadays. This was uh, beginning um, of the 20th century. In 1914, a French um, uh, person um, like Antonin Gosset and a Canadian uh, like anatomist and uh, GI physician Pierre Masson suggested that neuroendocrine tumor cells originate from these cells that were described uh, previously by uh, Dr. Heidenheim and Dr. Kulczynski. In 1922, um, insulin was uh, isolated uh, from a dog's pancreas by Banting and Best, um, which uh, you may remember, there, there they are with their dog, also won them the Nobel Prize. Um, serotonin, which is a very important part of uh, neuroendocrine tumor care um, and understanding how these tumors work, was um, isolated in the U.S. by um, Irvine Page, who you can see here in 1948. And then Robert Zollinger and Edwin um, Ellison as well in the US described the ZES or the Zollinger um, Ellison syndrome, um, which were um, ulcerogenic tumors uh, in two patients in 1955 um, at the American Surgical. Now they did not, um, it took them some time to understand that this were actually gastrin producing tumors, um, but, it, but they did describe uh, uh, that phenomenon. And then Wilfried Bauer and Trevor Petcher from Switzerland, very importantly, in 1979 synthesized an um, octipeptide that mimics natural somatostatin called uh, octreotide. So a uh, couple of words about uh, Dr. Um, Obendorfer. He was born in Munich in 1876, went to medical school in Munich and in, Ski and in Kiel as an assistant professor um, in pathology, described the term carcinoid. Um, he became the head of the department three years later in 1910, but unfortunately was forced to leave Germany because of the Nazis uh, taking power um, in 1933. 
he went to uh, like Turkey, became full professor and director of the pathology department there, but was never able to come back uh, and died in 1944. He termed, uh, or he coined the term uh, carcinoid, which essentially means tumor like. He described uh, seven cases of tumors um, in the distal small bowel. Um, uh, the, like the term that he came up with really was meant to describe a difference between actual cancers or tumors. Um, and so um, he observed that um, these tumors that he found in these seven patients were often multiple uh, and small, that their cells came from um, undifferentiated formations um, that well uh, defined that they would not um, invade, which turned out later on was not necessarily true. They, uh, he also described or thought at the time that they would not metastasize, which we um, obviously nowadays um, like also know is not true. Um, but uh, he was right in saying that they appear to grow uh, extremely slowly, do not reach um, any great size, uh, at least the primary tumors often don't, um, and uh, are harmless in nature, which um, obviously is also something that we probably wouldn't say nowadays. So neuroendocrine tumors come from uh, neuroendocrine cells and neuroendocrine cells can be found all around uh, the human body. They are uh, like peptide producing cells that share a neuroendocrine um, phenotype. Um, they um, are essentially like characterized by their um, ability to produce and secrete certain hormones um, up in stimulation by the autonomic nervous system. Um, they can be functioning or non-functioning. And I say here, at least clinically speaking, because a functioning neuroendocrine tumor, let's say, for example, a gastrinoma is a tumor of the duodenum of the pancreas secreting gastrin. We can measure gastrin levels. It causes certain symptoms. So that would be a functioning tumor. And then non-functioning tumors, for example, or lung neuroendocrine tumor, they rarely secrete any hormones. Um, but they can um, still be functioning in the sense that even though patients are not symptomatic and we can't measure uh, hormones that they're secreting, we, we may not just be um, aware of these hormones. So we don't know um, all the peptides and all the hormones that are secreted by these tumors. So um, when we talk about functioning versus non-functioning, it's purely on what we can measure and whether uh, the patient has symptoms related to um, that hormone that we can measure. And then uh, very importantly, and something you're going to hear uh, me talking about a lot throughout this talk is that you have to remember that neuroendocrine cells and neuroendocrine tumor cells both express a receptor called the somatostatin receptor. There are five different subtypes. The important one to know are subtype two and five. Um, and as I said before, you can find these tumors pretty much um, everywhere um, in the thyroid. Few chromocytomas and pyogangliomas are classified as neuroendocrine tumors lung and thymus, uh, like pituitary, but we are mostly going to focus um, on GI tract nets and uh, PNETs, which are pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the incidence and prevalence of neuroendocrine tumors are going up uh, steadily. This is a little bit of an older study, but even um, updated studies show the same. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors um, are more and more common. Um, we seem to see a, a higher rise in rectal, small bowel, and lung neuroendocrine tumors, but even in peanuts, which is here, uh, the black curse, you can see that tumors are rising. And I think we, an, an amazing stat is that the neuroendocrine uh, tumors of the small bowel are the second most prevalent gastrointestinal tumors after colon cancers, at least in the United States. So um, what do we ask our pathologists to come up with? Well, there are different... Um, stages, like we normally know um, any form of stage uh, for like any form of cancer, the AJCC, the American Joint Commission on Cancer, as well as the European Neuroendocrine uh, uh, like Tumor Society, ENETS, has classified these tumors according to the TNM system, which we all know about. Um, it's a little difference between ENETS and AJCC, for example. Here's an example for, uh, for PNETS. But uh, overall, uh, that's a, a, the standard way to classify these tumors. What makes these tumors different than um, other types of cancers is that we actually subclassify them as well according to their grade. 
Um, and it matters really, and I'll show you why in a second, what grade the tumor is. So by grade, uh, we mean the mitotic index that we can um, uh, measure with a, uh, with a staining using KI67. Um, and essentially, if you have a grade one neuroendocrine tumors, you have less than 3% that are positive, which means less than 3% are dividing at the time when the pathologist is looking at this. Um, and those are uh, uh, would be considered uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, grade two um, is 3 to 20% in KI67, and then grade three is, um, uh, is greater than 20%. Now, this is the older WHO classification, which I think a lot of people still use. The newer classification essentially shows that um, that uh, that you know uh, the, the, we subclassify grade three tumors into well differentiated grade three and then poorly differentiated grade three, which are called neuroendocrine carcinomas. And it matters to subclassify them. Why? Because number one, the morphology is different. So small cell lung cancer, for example, doesn't have the traditional nice neuroendocrine uh, features. Um, uh, it has necrosis, it has much smaller cells, it has much high KI67 index. So the morphology is how the cells appear. The grade is, is how quickly they are dividing. So small cell lung cancer is a neuroendocrine carcinoma. They usually have KI67 greater than 90%. But you do have well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors that are grade three. So you could have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that uh, appears uh, under the microscope as a well-differentiated tumor. Again, that is the morphology, but the KI67 is, let's say, 40%. And so 40% of the cells are dividing. At the time, when you look under the microscope, those tumors are definitely more aggressive than, let's say, a well-differentiated grade one neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. But they are not as bad, and they are getting treated differently than the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas or the PD neck, the pancreatic um, or in general, the next, the neuroendocrine carcinomas that uh, you see with, uh, for, for example, small cell lung cancer. Now, about half of the patients who present to us with small intestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, so that are the two most common that we see in our practice, um, are, have metastasis to the liver at the time when they present. That's an important feature, and I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, like, what is interesting is that Unlike other cancers where often the primary tumor is large and the burden of metastatic disease, uh, at least in the beginning, is relatively low, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and like pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors often when they have metastasized is very different. And that count, counts especially for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. They often are very, have very small primaries, one centimeter or less, but then the lymph node metastases and the distant metastases, so the entirety of the tumor volume, is quite different, as you can see here. It's sort of an inverse, um, uh, like paradigm, um, uh, as as uh, as seen here. And this was very nicely described in a paper by Dr. Palmier, which he published in 2016. But an important thing for you to know is that the number one cause of death in neuroendocrine tumor patients is liver failure due to overwhelming liver tumor burden. This is what these patients die of. And that is going to come back to what I'm going to talk to you down uh, later on, several slides down here, where uh, I'm going to tell you why it is so important to focus on the liver is really because of this overwhelming liver tumor burden. And this is what primarily kills these patients because they are slow growing tumors, remember. So how can we diagnose these patients? Can we diagnose them biochemically? Well, we can, but it's very challenging, to be honest with you. Uh, why? Because the most common marker that's used is chromogranin A. You may have heard about this. It's a neurosecretory pro a protein that's located in, in, in the, the vesicles of these tumor cells. The problem is that the sensitivity and the specificity uh, vary uh, uh, very wildly, and the positive, um, uh, uh, and they quite often have um, uh, uh, false positive values. So if patients are, for example, on a PPI, on a proton pump inhibitor, the chromogranin A levels can be really high, sometimes in the thousands, um, and, but they actually don't have a neuroendocrine tumor. So if you stop them uh, uh, or if you take them off their PPI and you recheck two weeks later, the chromogranin A then normalizes. So anytime somebody comes to you with a high chromogranin A level without any like evidence of neuroendocrine tumor, um, I would not rely on this too much. Uh, it's a marker with a lot of false positive. 
Um, NSC is something that we use sometimes with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, but not that often. Pancreastatin is something that in the US more and more centers are using. It's actually a derivative of chromogranate aids. It's nothing to do with the pancreas, but it was just called that way because it was discovered in the pancreas. Um, but um, some studies have shown that uh, it it's basically correlates better with progression-free survival and overall survival, um, but, not, but it's not readily avail uh, like available in all centers. Urinary 5-HIA or plasma serotonin is something that small bowel neuroendocrine tumors secrete and that produces uh, the typical carcinoid syndrome, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And then the classic gastrin, insulin, glucagon, VIP, somatostatin that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can secrete. Those are obviously markers that you should check for if you have a suspicion that your patient has a functioning pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. There's a new test called the NET test that's been validated in the U.S., as we speak, um, and it, it looks at messenger RNA levels of, of about 51 genes. It holds high promise. We'll have to see if it's really as good as it states it is. So there are additional studies being uh, done here, but this could be a test that may be useful in the future uh, in order to predict um, a tumor recurrence, in order to uh, like associate uh, tumor burden with prognosis, et cetera. The usual CT scans and MRIs can be done to detect these tumors, right? If you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you see a hypervascular lesion uh, in the pancreas. Um, the Octrio scan, uh, which is an older form of a scan that uses the somatostatin receptors to make these tumors light up, uh, is not used much in the US anymore. We use what's called the 68 gallon dotate PET CT. That is a scan that's been available now for about four or five years here, and which has shown, this is a study one of my co-fellows did when I was at the National Institutes of Health um, that was published in 2016, where, um, where they compared um, a gallon dotated PET-CT to octreotide CT and MRI. And you can see here that uh, dotated PET-CT is vastly superior to any of these modalities, but it's a functioning test and CT and MRI are like anatomical tests. So different things can be used for different reasons. So as a surgeon, we often like to see a CT scan. We want, want to understand where the lymphadenopathy is in relationship to vessels. We want to understand, uh, for example, in the liver, where is the tumor relationship to bile ducts? This is not something you're going to see on a dotated PET CT, but the PET CT will be uh, giving you a good overview because it's an entire body scan of where is the tumor burden. Um, sometimes it can help you detect the primary tumor if you can't find it. Um, so it's definitely helpful, but uh, not necessarily always. And when we published this study in 2019, when I was still at Rush, we looked at our first experiences, our first 50 patients or so um, with dotated PET-CT and how this changed our management and whether we should use it uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, preoperatively. And as you can see here, um, the, the majority of the lesions uh, were detected in the liver because it's where most patients, uh, most patients have, um, have uh, uh, these tumors spread. But um, overall, it only uh, brought up, um, or I should say, um, excuse me, this is actually not the study where we looked at pre-op. This is the study where we looked at all our patients, sorry, not just the pre-op patient. Uh, we looked at all our patients and we did see that inter versus intramodality change. So intramodality means that say the change in extent of surgery. Intermodality means, well, I'm not going to operate. I'm going to give them chemotherapy, for example. We did see that uh, dotated PET-CT at some form, at some point, you know, is actually really helpful. Um, and it changed management because it often can detect things like bone mets and um, other lesions that are difficult to say, uh, uh, to see on a regular scan. But I'll show you later that when, uh, when we did, a, when we specifically looked at pre-op management, so should everybody have a dotated prior to going to the operating room, it only changed management in about uh, uh, 10 to 15% of patients. So it may not be helpful to do it anytime you go to the operating room, but it may definitely be helpful to do it at some point throughout the patient's course, especially if they have metastatic disease. So here I give you an example um, of a 69-year-old male who had... Uh, wildly, uh, who had, excuse me, well-differentiated metastatic lung uh, neuroendocrine tumor to the liver. He had a Y90 um, embolization to the liver. 
and there was um, they put him on a transplant list because they thought that perhaps they can transplant his liver, which generally is not a good idea for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but um, uh, but they did an octuor scan, which saw some questionable lesion here in the mid abdomen, very faint uptake. And then they did a dotated pet, and look how clear the dotated pet shows that there were bone metastases. And everywhere here, you can see where there are dark spots. They're essentially uh, they're essentially uh, mesenteric lymph nodes and bone metastases. And so clearly, he fell off the transplant list. And a transplant in, uh, a transplant in this patient would not have been the right thing to do. So this is just an example to head-to-head compare true scan to dotated PET CT. It is a lot better to do a 68 gallon dotated PET CT. This is the study that I wanted to mention where we looked at um, um, a, a, some of our patients um, and, and we only saw that, uh, that uh, about five patients out of the 25, I think we looked at, uh, or the 20 patients preoperatively, there, were, there was a change in surgical management. Um, and, and I'm not sure you could consider these three patients as a real change, because in a sense, these patients presented with neuroendocrine tumor metastases to the liver. The primary tumor was in the bowel. Often you don't see these primary tumors on small bowel uh, uh, when they are within a small bowel on CT. But when you run the bowel, you're going to see them in the operating room. So, so I don't think it would have changed my management. Uh, I would have still gone and explored the bowel and I would have found these lesions. So that's why I'm saying, I don't think we necessarily need to consider dolite pet CT before every single um, single uh, uh, surgery. But I do think that uh, one interesting point out of this study was that a like MRI with EOVIST, uh, it may be known as Primovist in Europe or in the Middle East, which is a special dye that's excreted through the like the palatability phase is a like MRI that is particularly helpful at detecting liver metastases in these neuroendocrine tumors. And as you can see here, actually was even better than dotated PET CT at detecting liver metastases where we compared head to head. And um, we determined that the lesion size for PET scan uh, is about 0.95 centimeters. Everything below that, the PET scan, the dotated PET scan becomes very to detect liver lesions versus the, the like MRI with EOVIS can detect lesions that are smaller three or four millimeters. So the way we approach things at the University of Chicago is that anybody that goes to the operating room, uh, even if they have localized disease, initially gets at least a like MRI with EOVIS of the liver to make sure there is no metastatic disease in the liver. Um, and uh, depending on one case versus another, we may add a, a gallium dotated PET CT. But I do think you got to be highly suspicious that these tumors may have liver metastases, excuse me, that these patients may have liver metastases, which is the most common site where they will spread, whether the primary is in the pancreas, the colon, or the small bowel. Now, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, let's talk about those. Those are pretty common. Um, uh, as I told you, the second most common uh, source, um, uh, excuse me, the second most common site of, um, of uh, uh, like cancer within the GI tract in patients. Um, after the lung and the rectum, they are the second, uh, the third most common site of all neuroendocrine tumors. Um, they uh, metastasize um, often to the liver. Uh, they are most commonly found in the terminal ileum. Often we find uh, more than one primary. In about one third of patients, we can find more than one primary tumor. Um, uh, uh, you know, so it's always really important when you explore these patients that you run the entirety of the small bowel because you can have tumors that are more proximal and some that are more distal. Um, they have a high propensity to metastasize to mesenteric lymph nodes first especially if they reach one centimeters. Um, this is a, a nice example of a primary tumor that's relatively small here. And then you see a big uh, 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 mass, like mesenteric mass. Um, most common symptoms, if patients have symptoms, are abdominal pain due to the mesenteric mass, cramping, intestinal obstruction, and then obviously diarrhea, weight loss, and flushing are common. And that is often due to what we call the carcinoid syndrome. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are, are about 5 to 10% of all pancreatic malignancies. So they are not the most common cancer in the pancreas, but they certainly um, uh, represent a significant amount of numbers. 
Um, they derive from the um, islet cell of Langerhans. Most of them are non-functioning. Uh, they can be associated with some uh, familial syndromes such as MEN1, uh, VHL, uh, like tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis. Again, 50, 40 to 50% of patients present with distant metastases. And as you can see here, the blue curve is the overall survival of peanuts. The red curve is the overall survival of, small, uh, of uh, like adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. There's a big difference, but still the five-year survival of peanuts is only about 50%. A couple of people that died uh, that were known to have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors were Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, um, Aretha Franklin, and then the founder of Wendy's, which is probably less interesting for you, although you may have Wendy's in Kuwait. I'm not sure. I know they have Wendy's in Beirut, but I don't, I've never actually like been to Kuwait, so I don't know. But next time you do actually, have Wendy's... And you go like to, to Wendy's where you can think that the founder died of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, well, it's relatively straightforward. If they are localized, surgery is the only way to go. Why? Because that's the only way to cure these patients. You could do a Whipple, you could do a small bowel resection, colon resection, whatever needs to be done, needs to be done. Um, it's the only potential cure, as I said before. If you look at the NCCN guidelines, Right, right here, if complete resection possible, you should go for it, even if you have metastases. It gets more complicated when you have other things like, um, let's say you have a lot of liver tumors, so you can't really resect uh, the, the, the liver disease, but there's a big uh, or small bowel primary with a big mesenteric mass with obstructive symptoms or pain, you should definitely consider to resect the primary in this setting because you know, I told you 70 to 80% of patients die of overwhelming liver tumor burden, but the other 20 to 30% often die of complication of the small bowel, uh, or I should say of the neuroendocrine tumor, especially when it's small bowel, such as perforation, uh, bleeding, obstruction, etc. And then, you know, here you have a wide variety of all the things that we can do to treat uh, these tumors. So there's targeted chemotherapy like everolimus. Uh, or sunitinib, which doesn't work very well, has a lot of side effects. Um, you have liver-directed therapy, if there are any radiologists on the call, with bland embolization, Y90, etc. cetera, um, hepatic chemoembolization. This is helpful, especially if surgery is not an option uh, to control liver disease. You have um, interferon is not used much anymore. Cytotoxic chemotherapy doesn't work with neuroendocrine tumors, except if it's uh, high grade, uh, like small cell or neuroendocrine carcinoma. And then you have this new therapy called PRT or lutetium-177, which is a radioactive infusion that is given to the patient four times over an eight-month period. That's uh, uh, a, nice, a nice treatment. I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. But cytoreductive therapy, so liver debulking is something that we consider a lot in the, um, here at the University of Chicago. So should patients with GEPNETs, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and liver metastases undergo surgical de uh, debulking? So in order to understand whether surgery makes sense for patients that have metastatic disease, we need to understand what is available in our toolbox from the oncologic perspective, right? Because if the oncologists have something that keeps, uh, that, that can cure you or make you live decades without any complications, perhaps surgery is not a good option. So the first thing that you probably heard about and that I'm sure um, is part of, of the books you read is octreotide or somatostatin-like analogs, right? So there are two studies that you need to remember, the PROMIT and the CLARINET studies, which in 2009, 2014 showed that sandostatin or lanreotide, two different manufacturers, but essentially the same thing, which is long acting octreotide, a depot. And remember, octreotide inhibits the somatostatin receptors that are on, on, the, um, are, are on the cell surface of these tumor cells. Well, those somatostatin receptors, um, by the way, the PET scan also, I didn't tell you before, but the dotative PET scan, similar to the octreo scan, targets these somatostatin receptors just with a higher like affinity, which is why it makes it a better scan than the octreo scan. But the octreotide inhibits those receptors by binding them. And both studies here have shown that compared to placebo, um, in patients with metastatic gap nets, you have an improvement in progression-free survival, both for lanreotide as well as for sandostatin. So 
these are therapies that are good at keeping the tumor at bay for a while, sometimes several years, not very good at shrinking tumor. Because the objective response rate, so the shrinkage of tumor, grim 30% is only 1%. Talk to you about um, Everolimus and uh, sunitinib very briefly, but I don't have to go into details, but the radium trials and the sunitinib trials should, compared to placebo, placebo, the um, overall uh, progression-free survival benefit was about eight months or so. So six to eight months in either of these studies. So it's not that great. And again, the objective response rate is relatively low. So we don't use Everolimus and Sinitinib much. We use Octreotide, of course, a lot. Um, but uh, what we use when patients um, progress through Octreotide and surgery is not an option is this new therapy called peptide receptor radionucleotide therapy. So this is the um, NETA-1 trial where uh, patients got with, with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors was done in the US. So this PRT has been developed in Europe about 15 years ago. And the Europeans have a lot of data on it. The Dutch, the Swiss, they have a lot of data on it, but um, they, ha they hadn't really run a really good randomized trial yet. And so the Americans, uh, in order to get this approved by the Food and Drug Administration here in the US decided to run a, uh, a, a, a randomized trial, which they called the NETA-1 trial. And they only selected mid-gut, so small bowel neuroendocrine tumor patients, um, and they basically that were progressing on octreotide. And then they randomized them to doubling the octreotide dose versus getting PRT in addition to the octreotide at the same dose that they were on um, initially. And, and PRT, similar to octreotide, is actually octreotide. It's just bound... Uh, 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 lutetium, which is a better emitting particle, so it's a low dose radiation, that is bound to a peptide and to octreotide. And so this entire thing docks to the receptor uh, of the neuroendocrine tumor cells, gets internalized, and then basically technically causes DNA damage and a tumor cell death. It's a really beautiful therapy from a design perspective because it's very, very targeted. And here are the results of the NETA-1 trial. So the progression-free survival was dramatically improved. It was not reached at two years in the octreotide, uh, in the, in the uh, Luthothera group compared to the octreotide group. And the progression-free survival also was improved. But one of the problems was that the objective response rate, so the shrinkage of the, the metastases was only 18%, so less than 20%. So even though overall survival and progression-free survival helped with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, uh, Got, that got PRT, the objective response rate was low. This is the European data, and you can see here that interestingly, something too that I think is fascinating, which is what my lab is looking at here at the University of Chicago, is that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors had a much higher response rate in the 40 to 50% compared to mid-gut, which was 30% in the European series, 18% in the American series, as I showed you. And so we are looking at what makes pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors work better um, or respond better to PRT. Um, and there are probably some things that are intrinsic to, uh, to some like mutations, some things that are like intrinsic to pancreatic nets that make them more sensitive to PRT. But we did publish a paper in 2018 uh, reviewing all these articles and saying, look, first of all, none of these studies except for um, uh, for uh, the PROMIT and the clarinet study give us any information on liver tumor burden. So NETA-1 didn't give us information at the time on liver tumor burden of the patients. You know, uh, the sunitin and the radiant study didn't either. And again, why does it matter? Well, because tumors, because patients die of overwhelming liver disease. So I want to know how well these systemic therapies work on the liver. And we just don't have much information about that. So our argument was that as far as we have the data right now, there's limited efficacy of systemic therapy on liver metastases, and therefore surgery has a role. Now, there is something interesting that came back uh, out uh, several years later, as a matter of fact, in 2019, saying that um, when they looked at the subgroup analysis of the NETA-1 trial, and again, there's only small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, they found that patients that had Tumor, uh, tumors that were greater than three centimeters 
had a decrease in, in the liver had a decreased progression free survival. So that is interesting because that may argue for removing large tumors in the liver surgically and giving PRT to treat the micrometastatic disease. So why surgery for liver metastases? Well, surgery is the only potential for cure if the liver, if the tumor is localized. And when it goes to the liver, I have a few patients, but it's a few where I've resected the, the liver metastases and you know, five years later, nothing has come back. Those patients may be cured. But I will say, and I counsel my patients that when we talk about liver debulking or removing liver metastases, you have to be aware that in 90 to 95% of patients, these tumors will come back over time. But um, studies have shown that there clearly is a survival advantage of surgery versus no surgery. Um, the objective response rate, so the tumor shrinkage is much higher than PRT or any other therapies with surgery. And you can reset the clock. Remember, these are slow growing tumors. So let's say you were diagnosed with stage four disease in 2015, you know, it's 2021 20, now, so six years ago, you know, um, if it, it, the tumor is slowly grown in the liver, if I take out 90% or most of the tumor liver, uh, uh, most of the liver in the tumor, the tumor in the liver, sorry, I can, post, I can put you back three, four, five years back to 2016 or 2017, because it may take three to four years until the tumor grows back to the level where it was. So really liver debulking for slow growing tumors makes a lot of sense. It doesn't obviously for fast growing tumors. There's a question and I'll show you a paper about this, whether surgery makes systemic therapies better. And then uh, complications are much decreased. We use what's called parenchymal sparing resections uh, with or without microwave ablations. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, you know, we rarely do big liver debulking, uh, uh, big liver resections. We pluck these things out one by one, and I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. So many studies have shown survival benefits. These are all retrospective, so they are biased, of course. That's what the oncologists always tell us. But it's very difficult to, to design a prospective randomized study because if somebody comes in my office and I tell them I can take out 95% of their tumor, uh, out of the liver and they're going to die of overwhelming liver tumor burden, then most patients will go for surgery. They're not going to be happy to be randomized into a non-surgical group. These are many studies suggesting, again, the same. Uh, is liver surgery safe? Dr. Ha and Dr. Pami were two high volume surgeons in the United States have looked at this and yes, it, it turns out it is safe, both for pancreatic and for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. The complication rate is less than 20% for clavian 3 and 4. There's a, a question that Dr. Pami brought on the uh, uh, spectrum uh, a few years ago, asking whether, you know, 70% versus 90% would make a difference in terms of debulking and um, the threshold. And, and, you know, without going too much detail, 70% is still pretty good in terms of survival. Um, it's probably not quite as good as 90%, but it's, but it's pretty good. But if somebody has really bad liver disease um, and it's overwhelming, I don't think there's any point in trying to debulk it if you can't reach at least 70% tumor removal. So when I look um, at, a, at a case where I'm going to do a liver debulking, um, I actually look at uh, where are these tumors located right? Um, similarly to classic HPV surgery, you're going to want to know what, uh, uh, what important structures these things are close to. And remember, the liver has inflow and outflow. The inflow is the portal vein and the hepatic artery. Uh, the outflow are the three hepatic veins. And generally, you always need to leave one inflow and one outflow, otherwise things are going to end up really badly for you and more importantly for the patient. Um, but when we do parenchymal sparing resections, we're trying to keep the entire architecture of the liver intact. So we're trying to preserve all inflow and all outflow. So we, an we analyze whether the tumors are uni versus bilober. We analyze what the relationship is of the tumors to these inflow and outflow structures. We look at the overall liver tumor burden, right? So we don't know exactly on some studies have suggested that maybe 25 or 50% is a cutoff where afterwards you shouldn't operate. 
individual tumor size matters. We have really fancy things like uh, like uh, 3D uh, programs that can um, actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, help you uh, navigate and design where these tumors are in relationship to uh, to the structures. Or you could just do it old school and just draw it out like anything else. You know, you draw out your 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 vessels, your inflow, your outflow, your draws. Where are the lesions? This is just an example on how to plan for these operations. The question that I uh, that I think is the most important when you talk about neuroendocrine tumors and debulking as surgeons is when to resect, right? Give an example. This is a 45-year-old male uh, who had a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor diagnosed in 2015, had his primary tumor removed, liver metastasis diagnosed in 2016, uh, but asymptomatic. Uh, he had no progression of disease while being on octreotide, and this is what its dotatate shows. So dotatate shows there are some liver, uh, some um, um, uh, bone disease, and then this is quite a bit of disease in the liver here, as you can see. So when you look at the like MRI with eovist, again, it's a beautiful eovist face. And how do I know you're an eovist? You know it because your bile duct lights up white. Because remember, it's a delayed, like a palatability phase. The contrast gets excreted through the bile duct. So you end up having a really beautiful, uh, um, like hepatic, uh, or, 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 you know, bile duct uh, that light up. So here you could see, here you could see those bile ducts as well. Uh, here you could see that that lesion here in the center is tricky because it sits right on the posterior pedicle and right along the middle hepatic vein. So, you know, people told him, well, you can't resect this unless you do a right hemi hepatectomy and, you know, it gets difficult because then you only have half of the liver and then you have some stuff on the left side as well. So they basically told him he's not a surgical candidate. But the truth of the matter is it, he really is because what we do is sometimes we use the CUSA, often we use the bipolar, almost, uh, almost always. We literally carve these tumors out one by one, right? So we coagulate the uh, liver parenchyma, we clean it with the CUSA, and then um, what happens I'm gonna, is that if we see a bile duct, we put a clip, right? So a small bile duct here, you can free up with the bipolar and the CUSA, and then you can cut uh, those lesions, you can get the tumor out. It allows you to have very little um, uh, normal liver loss, and, uh, and it, it allows you to have a very low percentage bile leaks. So this is a 3D navigation device that Sama knows because we've used it quite a bit at the University of Chicago. We're one of the first 10 centers in the US to use it. Medtronic uh, developed this, but this is essentially 3D ultrasound guided navigation. So it's beautiful because it allows you to easily, both laparoscopic and open, put the catheter right in the middle of the tumor. You got this green thing here, which is the bullseye. Uh, you can come from any angle you want, so you don't have to hold it in certain uh, uh, angle according to your like ultrasound probe. And then, um, according to the watch you use, uh, use and the time you ablate, your zone here, which is the red, your ablation zone is basically being dictated, which is really important when you try to ablate things close to bile ducts because you don't want to fry some major bile duct and have biliary strictures within the liver. So this is a really beautiful way to uh, take care of some of the tumors that are less than three centimeters and deeper in the liver. So this liver that I described to you about, this is what it looks like after we're done. I like to call it the shark liver. It's like somebody, a shark came by and bit out the lesions. So you can see here one by one, we take out all these lesions, but we present or prevent, as I say, said before, inflow and outflow. And I think that is really important um, because you are able to essentially clean out the liver really well. And as you can see here, this was the big cavity where we literally dive all the way down in the liver. We took the middle hepatic vein, we took the posterior pedicle, and this is how you can achieve these type of results. That um, then this is the MRI after, uh, excuse me, the CT post-op with 23 lesions resected, resected 25 ablated. This is these are the ablation zones. This is the MRI one, le one year later. You can see the, the, the center of the liver is a little contracted, but there are no, uh, no lesions that are uh, visible one year after surgery. So 
Um, obviously, to any surgical procedure, there are oncologic and technical limitations. You know, several things that need that need to be uh, considered are like extrahepatic disease, liver tumor volumes. Um, should we debulk when you have a like hepatic cholecystectomy in place? Um, other things that are important is you want to make sure that patients continue to stay uh, sane and stable, right? So uh, in patients with carcinoid syndrome, for example, that have high serotonin production from the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, should we put them on an octreotide drip? And then the, the question as well for surgeons is, should we do a routine cholecystectomy uh, during, uh, uh, during these resections? So we looked at this data and essentially we showed that um, uh, you can resect when you have extrahepatic disease because again, often patients don't die of bone metastases, they actually die of liver metastases. So here you could see on the right-hand side, those were the patient's uh, long-term survival after looking at the National Cancer Database here in the US, uh, which was not quite as good as if they don't have extrahepatic disease, but it's still a lot better if they undergo liver debulking, um, then if they have extrahepatic disease and don't undergo liver debulking. If you look at the ENET guidelines for resection, um, you know, they have a little bit of an, they have an interesting way to look at it. So they, they look at, at, um, at uh, things saying, uh, is your tumor, uh, uh, is the pattern of liver metastasis complex or not? Um, I tend not to agree with that. I don't really care whether these metastases are unilober or bilober. Um, I, I, I can't remember the last time I had to do a, uh, a, a portal vein ligation or portal vein um, embolization for two-step surgery for, for these lesions. Um, I think it's more a liver tumor uh, burden question than it is really um, a, a, a lober, uh, uh, like unilober versus bilober question. And this is a good um, example, right? So if you look at prognosis, there are some studies that looked at like hepatic tumor burden less than 10%, 11 to 25%, uh, greater than 25% or greater than 50%. But as you can see here, the survival really, um, once you get greater than 50%, tanks dramatically. Once you're less than 10%, it's pretty good. And then 25 to 50% stays about the same. But I do think that um, hepatic tumor burden is, is more important than location or number of lesions. There was an interesting study saying, um, asking the question of whether as a surgeon or radiologist, we need to actually physically quantify the tumor burden. So, you know, with 3D softwares and things like that. And actually, interestingly, the semi-quantitative versus the quantitative. So quantitative was where, where they really calculate, they, they marked out every tumor and they calculated the tumor volume, uh, which was very time consuming, it took about 40 to, uh, to 55 minutes on average. Um, but then the semi-quantitative was sort of like, yeah, you know, I'm going to say it's less than 10, 11 to 25, 20, 26 to 50, greater than 50. There really weren't major like differences in a semi-quantitative way, meaning that those studies I showed you before when the surgeon said that they debug 70% versus 90%, most of the time, actually, they are right um, when they assess tumor burden uh, like ahead of time. It, you don't always have to quantify things uh, perfectly. Somebody has, let's say, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that has you know, metastasis to the liver, how would we approach it? If, if, if we want to do a liver debulking, we would first do the liver and then the pancreas. The reason is that we would want to try to ideally avoid a, to do microwave ablation or liver resection in a patient that have had hepatic because bacteria can go up the biliary tree, especially if you do microwave ablations and cause hepatic abscesses. These are some studies that have shown this. Um, but overall, I mean, if you treat these patients with antibiotics, um, so let's say a patient that had a Whipple five years ago comes back five years later with now liver metastases uh, that you think you can debulk, you don't have to not debulk them. You could still do it even if they have a paticogegenostomy in place. You should just consider that they are at high risk to developing liver abscesses, which is why you should give them antibiotics for one to two weeks, ideally. So um, 
the last couple of subjects I wanted to talk to you about, which is always a question that I think our like anesthesiologists ask them, um, ask us, you know, should we run an otreotide drip in a patient with a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor that has a, a that is carcinoid syndrome in a high uh, urinary 5-HIA or plasma serotonin levels? Um, does the otreotide really make it safer for the patient to undergo an operation? And the bottom line with this, I'm not going to go through all the studies, but this study uh, was the first study that looked at this in 2001, and they thought that perhaps it did make a difference if you ran octreotide. Then, um, then uh, studies later on actually um, looked at a, different, uh, a, diff a little bit of different criteria on how they defined the carcinogenic crisis, but they showed that it really didn't make that big of a difference whether you ran it or not. So, um, and that, um, that, you know, depending on what definition you use, you can have up to 30% of patients that have carcinoid crisis or less than 5%. You know, it really depends a little bit, I think, on what you use as a definition. But overall, um, uh, my advice is um, octreotide drip are, are, are very pricey. So if patients are on long-acting octreotide, so on the monthly shot prior to come to the OR, which most people will, unless they have severe breakthrough symptoms, um, so they need rescue short-acting shots at home before they come to the OR. My advice is to have your cure type trip ready, but not to run it until you can clearly see in the operating room whether your patient has hemodynamic instability. And then even then, when they do have hemodynamic instability, the running the cure type trip often doesn't make the difference. The difference makes uh, is uh, uh, depends on, on whether they need vasopressors or not. So they become hypotensive, they should just go on vasopressors, you know, and then usually it's just a transient crisis. So um, I don't think there's any clear data demonstrating that carcinogenic crisis can be avoided with intraoperative administration of octreotide. Uh, but, but again, I do think it's acceptable in, in, in a certain uh, patient population um, that either are very symptomatic, need rescue level, have very high serotonin levels. Um, I think all of them um, I think could certainly uh, be patients where you would want to use it if you want to stay safe. Another question is about prophylactic cholecystectomy during small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. So, um, you know, should anyone with a, with a neuroendocrine tumor uh, get a, a prophylactic cholecystectomy? Um, this is based on data that um, shows that if you are on octreotide, on long acting octreotide, you have a much higher. Uh, likelihood of developing complications due to your gallbladder. So as you know, gallstones occur already, at least in the U.S., in about 10 to 20 percent of the general population, uh, but that incidence is higher when you compare patients that are on somatostatin or on octreotide like analogs, and then 77 percent of patients with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor uh, will require somatostatin receptors throughout their lifetimes, uh, throughout the lifetime. And I can say that for pancreatic, it's very similar. So we do think that um, we do think that um, uh, that because of the study that was published in 2010, where uh, they looked at 144 patients um, uh, that were on somatostatin on long acting octreotide, 43 that were not on octreotide. Um, and they saw that 63% had gallstones. Um, uh, uh, and in about 22% of those that did not undergo a cholecystectomy required a cholecystectomy um, at, at, at a later point in the somatostatin receptor group. Um, so that's a pretty high odds, right? And remember, if you operate on the liver, you know, your patient will is metastatic, so they will almost for certainty uh, um, uh, need some, act, some form of octreotide long-term. So, my general rule is this. I think you should do a prophylactic cholecystectomy in any metastatic tumor uh, if you operate on the liver uh, or if you operate on the tumor. Um, I don't think it needs to be done if you have a localized small bowel neuroendocrine tumor or a localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor where you do a surgical resection of the primary tumor and are thinking that you're going to cure the patient. Because if you cure the patient, the patient won't have to go on a triotide long term. So it's a little bit on trying to understand how high you think the risk of, of disease recurrence is. 
But if it's metastatic or if it's locally advanced, probably considering um, considering a cholecystectomy is certainly uh, a good idea. Another question is whether the primary tumor should be resected in patients with unresectable disease. I briefly mentioned this on the NCCN guidelines uh, that this could certainly be considered. So this is an example of a patient you can see here has a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, has lots of disease all over the liver, right? So that's, a, and, and then has this big mesenteric mass here. So you can't resect the liver too much disease, right? But should you resect the primary tumor? And the answer to that is probably yes, because he has a large mesenteric mass. And again, if he doesn't die of overwhelming, he or she doesn't die of overwhelming liver disease, you may, these tumors may die, or these patients may die of, um, of uh, complication of the primary tumor, such as obstruction, bleeding, um, um, like perforations, etc. So if it's symptomatic small bowel primary, even if you can't remove the liver metastases, take the primary tumor out and take the gallbladder out in those patients. But what about those patients that have a tiny small bowel neuroendocrine tumor that is not symptomatic, that don't have a large mesenteric mass? Well, those are the ones where there's argumentation and controversy going on. Some people argue that these, tumor, that these patients are never truly asymptomatic. So if you ask questions, you're going to find that they're symptomatic. You can avoid potentially symptoms or complications. Uh, that's always a little bit tricky for surgeons, right? Um, when you t tell somebody, I want to do an operation to avoid something that's not present, it's always a little dangerous because we never really know what's going to happen, right? Um, but the important part is that it may lead to survival benefit. And our group and like others have shown looking at large databases that if you resect the primary tumor, um, you uh, in small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, and that's true, by the way, for pancreatic and lung as well, you actually end up um, improving uh, long-term survival. Um, we try to identify whether, um, uh, whether there, there were any particular, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, factors or variable where you should or should not resect the primary tumor. With small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, Essentially, all patients we determined uh, should uh, have a resection of uh, the primary tumor to improve survival. For pancreas, it was only the low grades. And then for colon uh, and rectum, the size seemed to matter. Um, uh, so, so I would say that uh, generally, uh, you would want to take the small bowel neuroendocrine tumor out in a patient with, uh, with metastatic disease, even if you can't resect the primary tumor. This was a study performed by Dr. Singh at City of Hope, where he looked at the California registry. And again, here, interestingly, saw that it showed that taking out the primary tumor may actually be beneficial, uh, regardless of whether uh, you had treated the, the liver metastases with liver metastases, with the liver directed therapy or not. And this was especially true again for small bowel, but also for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So resection of primary tumor, we think at least um, in the U.S., some centers that uh, we see improved survival. Um, there are retrospective studies and non-randomized. That's true. So maybe we should aim to do a, a, a prospective randomized study for that. Um, but um, most studies have looked at relatively good attempt to minimize selection bias. Um, so uh, we need a little bit more data, but we are pretty aggressive here to resect the primary tumor. Now, if it's, let's say, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with unresectable, in the head of the pancreas with unresectable distal disease without any jaundice or any issues, you know, I would say that's more difficult because resecting, uh, uh, doing a Whipple operation for somebody that's completely asymptomatic and you were not going to be able to clean out the liver, I would say probably I would hold off on that. But if it's a tumor in the tail of the pancreas and you can easily resect it, I think that, or in a small bowel, like I said, I think those are the patients that would benefit best. And then the last piece of uh, study, which I think is interesting, comes out of, a, out of Europe, but of Bad Berka, which they've used a lot of PRT. They've shown that um, this comes back to a little bit what I said before, is surgery really, can we as surgeon make an argument to the oncologist to say that liver debulking and surgical uh, uh, debulking makes sense? Um, 
Well, this um, showed that um, if you resect the primary tumor um, in all patients, and these were over a thousand patients that received PRT, those that where you resected the primary tumor, the probability of an event uh, was much lower. So again, it suggests that perhaps PRT um, is working better if surgery has been performed, whether it's liver debulking or whether it's resection of the primary tumor. So I think uh, we have a lot of research um, that needs to be done. We need to improve PRT to improve objective response rates. I think um, we need to improve our way to uh, do surgical resections. A lot of these cases, because they have they are big open cases, are done uh, are done with a big incision. Uh, but with new technologies such as microwave ablations, that is uh, like navigation um, triggered nowadays. You know, we can do some of these lesions, uh, these these cases laparoscopic. Um, but I think advancement in both systemic therapies and especially I would say PRT as well as liver directed therapies, whether it's debulking or blend embolization or Y90, I think it's really exciting. Um, and and uh, and, and to me, it's not so much about, you know, what is better than the other. I think these are all options that are necessary and good to treat neuroendocrine tumors. I just feel that uh, you as surgical specialists uh, should be aware of the fact that surgery has a role to play. Uh, and I hope I made that point today. And I'm happy to take um, any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you for this affirmative session. Uh, uh, we have, I think, one question, the Q&A panel. Are, are you able to, to see it, doctor? Let me see. I go on the chat box or... Yeah, I see yeah, it. I, the Q&A panel on the right. Oh, the Q&A panel, sorry. Okay, explain the Lanria type graph. Okay, let's go back. Okay, one second, let me just reshare this. Yeah, I went through it quickly. All right, so, um, and I'm, I'm gonna go through the NCCN guidelines with you guys one more time so you understand how we treat these tumors. I think hopefully the diagnosis was pretty clear, right? MRI, CT, dotate PET CT, those are the things that are helpful to diagnose. Uh, Chromogranate, not so much. You remember, I talked to you about this. All right, so here we go. All right, so if you go back on the lanreotide, which again is long-acting obturotide. So the difference between the PROMIT study and the clarinet study was that the uh, lanreotide or the clarinet study included patients that did not necessarily progress within six months. So in the PROMIT studies, all patients were progressing. In the Lanreotide studies, they were, um, you had some patients that were not progressing within the past six months um, and progressing right that the tumor is actively growing. But essentially what this shows is that um, the blue curve is the curve where you have, uh, that did not receive any treatment, so they got placebo. And then Lanreotide is the red curve and the median, uh, time, which is 50% at two years, which is 24 months here, was not reached in the lanreotide group. And it was reached approximately after 18 months. But again, remember, they are placebo. So, right, so 50% of patients at 18 months still didn't progress even without any therapy. So this, again, tells you about the slow-growing nature of this disease and also of the inclusion of the study because they didn't just include patients that progressed. If you look at the PROMIT study, which is Sanderstatin, you know, you could see that 50% here progressed at about six to, to, to eight months. And this is what we see, right? So they were already progressing. You don't treat them depending on how often you scan them. If you scan them every three months or every six months, well, the next scan, you're going to see that they have progressed, right? Versus, um, versus the octreotide group here, the progression-free survival was 14.3 uh, months. So that means that you get a, an effective benefit of about eight months if you treat them with sandostatin. But again, the 
the, the groups were not exactly the same, so you can't really compare one study to another. We use Sanostatin or Lanreotide. I think both are good options depending on insurance coverage and, you know, what patients are, um, are, are you know, uh, uh, willing to get because the Lanreotide is a deep sub-Q. The Sanostatin is an IM injection, so Sanostatin may hurt a little bit more. Uh, but I would say that depending on that, uh, we give them one or the other. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back here. I wanted to go back to the NCCN guidelines because I think I, I went through a lot of things here. But remember, the primary tumor, so you have diagnosed your neuroendocrine tumor, right? Um, you have ruled out biochemical, right? So if they're functioning, so if it's a pancreas, you have ruled out it's an insulinoma or gastrinoma. You know, um, if it's a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, so you have figured out you send a serotonin or urinary 5-HIA level. So you figure that out. Um, and now um, if the tumor is localized, you operate. If it's localized with very little disease that's, me that's metastatic, let's say, to the liver, you would go and resect all of that. Now, if, if uh, you have um, uh, low tumor burden uh, and it's metastatic, but you don't want to resect, or the patient doesn't want an operation, or for some reason the patient is too sick, then you have the choice between doing nothing and just watching, because remember, these are slow-growing tumors, or put them on octreotide. But I would say that most of our patients, when they were diagnosed initially, you know, if we don't operate, and sometimes we even um, wait until we operate to see what the biology of the disease is going to be, I put on octreotide or lanreotide, right? So let's say somebody comes in, metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, we put them on octreotide, you know, we wait three to six months, if everything stays stable, the biology looks good, they are resectable, uh, both locally and metastatic disease, we take them to the OR. So really octreotide or lanreotide only has a role to play in patients that are metastatic, okay? And then... Um, as I said before, if you have a primary tumor, you should probably consider resecting it, even if you can't resect the liver. But then what do you do with patients with bone mats and liver mats and all these other things? And this is where all of this, these things come in. Like we talked about this, everolimus, sunitinib, lutetium-177, which is PRT, liver-directed therapy, liver debulking, which was most of my talk today was about that, making an argument. These are all things that can be used to treat these tumors. The question is just, what do you use at what point? And if you play your game well, and if you know what you're talking about, you can make these patients live a very long time if you use the right thing at the right time. So for example, a patient comes in with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, metastasized to the liver. You know, I can buy lower disease, but I can take out most of the disease. We put them on octreotide. After three months, nothing has changed. Great. We know it's a favorable biology. I'll take them to the OR, I'll do a right hemicolectomy, a small bowel resection, do a cholecystectomy, I'll clean out the liver. After that, I take them off the octreotide because they don't need it anymore because it's a slow growing tumor because then I would be more in this category where I would observe because I've taken out all of the tumor, everything I could see, and I know they will recur probably at some point, but I'll just wait. So the average after debulking for a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor is three to five years to recur. So let's say four years later, the patient, come, we, we follow them regularly, obviously, has liver metastases that have recurred. At that point, we can still put them on octreotide, and that can give them one and a half, three, sometimes five years without any progression of disease. So now you've had four years plus five years, that's already nine years, right, of, of good quality of life, no complications because the primary tumor is out, and those patients are living a good life and they, they, they are doing well. Um, and now the tumor has grown uh, on the octreotide. Then you would consider, like you see here, if disease progression on octreotide or lanreotide, you could either take them back to the OR for a second or third time, which I've done before, or you can consider liver-directed therapy or PRT. And that can, especially PRT, can give you, like you saw from the NETA-1 trial, an additional four, five, six, seven years, you know, uh, where the tumor doesn't shrink, but at least it stays stable. And so... By adding these different therapies at the right time, you know, you can really prolong somebody's life and hopefully make them live, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. That's really the, the, the treatment goal. So surgery is not there to cure. It's just there to help other therapies work better or, or, or to improve survival.
I'm going to stop sharing again. Any right. other questions? I, I don't think we have another question. Uh, so uh, we will end the session here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Xavier, for this informative uh, session. And it's been an honor and privilege to have you on our platform. Uh, before we end, uh, Yeah, so just before we end, uh, don't forget to register to our new, uh, our three session, uh, surgical, uh, search quite, uh, yeah. Uh, before we end, please don't forget to register to our search quite uh, research, ABC of research and the plastic surgery foundation course. And uh, the last two sessions of the surgical fix series volume two. Uh, these courses are all CME accredited. Uh, so take your time and, uh, and register. Thank you again for joining and thank you again, Dr. Xavier. Sure, it was an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.